Henry James, Wikipedia Audio Henry James, O.M. April 15, 1843 February 28, 1916 was an American author regarded as a key transitional figure between literary realism and literary modernism, and is considered by many to be among the greatest novelists in the English language. He was the son of Henry James Sr. and the brother of renowned philosopher and psychologist William James and diarist Alice James. He is best known for a number of novels dealing with the social and marital interplay between émigré Americans, English people, and continental Europeans. Examples of such novels include The Portrait of a Lady, The Ambassadors, and The Wings of the Dove. His later works were increasingly experimental. In describing the internal states of mind and social dynamics of his characters, James often made use of a personal style in which ambiguous or contradictory motivations and impressions were overlaid or closely juxtaposed in the discussion of a single character's psyche. For their unique ambiguity, as well as for other aspects of their composition, his late works have been compared to Impressionist painting. In addition to voluminous works of fiction, James published articles and books of criticism, travel, biography, autobiography, and plays. Born in the United States, James largely relocated to Europe as a young man and eventually settled in England, becoming a British subject in 1915, one year before his death. James was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1911, 1912, and 1916. Life James was born at 2, Washington Place in New York City on April 15, 1843. His parents were Mary Walsh and Henry James Sr. His father was intelligent, steadfastly congenial, and a lecturer and philosopher who had inherited independent means from his father, an Albany banker and investor. Mary came from a wealthy family long settled in New York City. Her sister Catherine lived with her adult family for an extended period of time. Henry Jr. had three brothers, William, who was one year his senior and younger brothers Wilkinson and Robertson. His younger sister was Alice. The family first lived in Albany and then moved to 14th Street in New York City when James was still a young boy. His education was calculated by his father to expose him to many influences, primarily scientific and philosophical, it was described as extraordinarily haphazard and promiscuous. James did not share the usual education in Latin and Greek classics. Between 1855 and 1860, the James household traveled to London, Paris, Geneva, Boulogne-sur-Mer, and Newport, Rhode Island, according to the father's current interests and publishing ventures, retreating to the United States when funds were low. Henry studied primarily with tutors and briefly attended schools while the family traveled in Europe. Their longest stays were in France, where Henry began to feel at home and became fluent in French. He was afflicted with a stutter, which seems to have manifested itself only when he spoke English. In French, he did not stutter. A Tragedy of Error, Short Story the Story of a Year, Short Story, A Passionate Pilgrim, Novella, Madame de Mauves, Novella, Daisy Miller, Novella, The Osborne Papers, Novella, The Lesson of the Master, Novella, The Pupil, Short Story, The Figure in the Carpet, Short Story, The Beast in the Jungle, Novella. In 1860 the family returned to Newport. There Henry became a friend of the painter John Lafarge, who introduced him to French literature, and in particular, to Balzac. <laughs>
James later called Balzac his greatest master, and said that he had learned more about the craft of fiction from him than from anyone else. In the autumn of 1861 Henry received an injury, probably to his back, while fighting a fire. This injury, which resurfaced at times throughout his life, made him unfit for military service in the American Civil War. In 1864 the James family moved to Boston, Massachusetts to be near William, who had enrolled first in the Lawrence Scientific School at Harvard and then in the medical school. In 1862 Henry attended Harvard Law School, but realized that he was not interested in studying law. He pursued his interest in literature and associated with authors and critics William Dean Howells and Charles Eliot Norton in Boston and Cambridge, formed lifelong friendships with Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr., the future Supreme Court Justice, and with James and Annie Fields, his first professional mentors. His first published work was a review of a stage performance, Miss Maggie Mitchell and Fanchon the Cricket published in 1863. About a year later, A Tragedy of Error, his first short story, was published anonymously. James's first payment was for an appreciation of Sir Walter Scott's novels, written for the North American Review. He wrote fiction and non-fiction pieces for The Nation and Atlantic Monthly, where Fields was editor. In 1871 he published his first novel, Watch and Ward, in serial form in the Atlantic Monthly. The novel was later published in book form in 1978. During a 14-month trip through Europe in 1869-70 he met Ruskin, Dickens, Matthew Arnold, William Morris, and George Eliot. Rome impressed him profoundly. Here I am then in the Eternal City, he wrote to his brother William. At last for the first time I live. He attempted to support himself as a freelance writer in Rome, then secured a position as Paris correspondent for the New York Tribune, through the influence of its editor John Hay. When these efforts failed he returned to New York City. During 1874 and 1875 he published Transatlantic Sketches, A Passionate Pilgrim, and Roderick Hudson. During this early period in his career he was influenced by Hawthorne. Boone by H.G. Wells, author, author by David Lodge, youth by J.M. Cutsey. The Master by Calm Toybin, Hotel de Dream by Edmund White, Lions at Lamb House by Edwin M. Yoder, Felony by Emma Tennant, Dictation by Cynthia Ozick, The James Boys by Richard Liebman Smith, The Open Door, by Elizabeth McGuire, The Great Divide by Rex Hunter, The Master at St. Bartholomew's Hospital, 1914-1916 by Joyce Carol Oates, The Typewriter's Tale, by Michael Haynes, Henry James' Midnight Song, by Carol de Chellis Hill, The Fifth Heart, by Dan Simmons, Empire, by Gore Vidal, The Maze at Windermere, by Gregory Blake Smith. In 1869 he settled in London. There he established relationships with Macmillan and other publishers, who paid for serial installments that they would later publish in book form. The audience for these serialized novels was largely made up of middle-class women, and James struggled to fashion serious literary work within the strictures imposed by editors and publishers' notions of what was suitable for young women to read. He lived in rented rooms but was able to join gentlemen's clubs that had libraries and where he could entertain male friends. He was introduced to English society by Henry Adams and Charles Milnes Gaskell, the latter introducing him to the Travelers and the Reform Clubs.
In the fall of 1875 he moved to the Latin Quarter of Paris. Aside from two trips to America, he spent the next three decades the rest of his life in Europe. In Paris he met Zola, Alphonse Daudet, Maupassant, Turgenev, and others. He stayed in Paris only a year before moving to London. Early Years, 1843-1883 In England he met the leading figures of politics and culture. He continued to be a prolific writer, producing The American, The Europeans, a revision of Watch and Ward, French poets and novelists, Hawthorne, and several shorter works of fiction. In 1878 Daisy Miller established his fame on both sides of the Atlantic. It drew notice perhaps mostly because it depicted a woman whose behavior is outside the social norms of Europe. He also began his first masterpiece, The Portrait of a Lady, which would appear in 1881. In 1877 he first visited Wenlock Abbey in Shropshire, home of his friend Charles Milnes Gaskell whom he had met through Henry Adams. He was much inspired by the darkly romantic abbey and the surrounding countryside, which features in his essay Abbeys and Castles. In particular the gloomy monastic fish ponds behind the abbey are said to have inspired the lake in the turn of the screw. While living in London, James continued to follow the careers of the French realists, Émile Zola in particular. Their stylistic methods influenced his own work in the years to come. Hawthorne's influence on him faded during this period, replaced by George Eliot and Ivan Turgenev. 1879-1882 saw the publication of the Europeans, Washington Square, Confidence, and the Portrait of a Lady. He visited America in 1882-1883, then returned to London. The period from 1881 to 1883 was marked by several losses. His mother died in 1881 followed by his father a few months later, and then by his brother Wilkie. Emerson, an old family friend, died in 1882. His friend Turgenev died in 1883. In 1884 James made another visit to Paris. There he met again with Zola, Daudet and Goncourt. He had been following the careers of the French realist or naturalist writers, and was increasingly influenced by them. In 1886, he published The Bostonians and The Princess Casamassima, both influenced by the French writers he'd studied assiduously. Critical reaction and sales were poor. He wrote to Howells that the books had hurt his career rather than helped because they had reduced the desire, and demand, for my productions to zero. During this time he became friends with Robert Louis Stevenson, John Singer Sargent, Edmund Goss, George Du Maurier, Paul Bourget, and Constance Fenimore Wilson. His third novel from the 1880s was The Tragic Muse. Although he was following the precepts of Zola in his novels of the 80s, their tone and attitude are closer to the fiction of Alphonse Daudet. The lack of critical and financial success for his novels during this period led him to try writing for the theatre. After the stage failure of Guy Domville, James was near despair and thoughts of death plagued him. The years spent on dramatic works were not entirely a loss. As he moved into the last phase of his career he found ways to adapt dramatic techniques into the novel form. In the late 80s and throughout the 90s James made several trips through Europe. He spent a long stay in Italy in 1887. In that year the short novel The Osborne Papers and The Reverberator were published.
Middle Years, 1884-1897 Late Years, 1898-1916 In 1897 1898 he moved to Rye, Sussex, and wrote The Turn of the Screw. 1899-1900 saw the publication of The Awkward Age and The Sacred Fount. During 1902-1904 he wrote The Ambassadors, The Wings of the Dove, and The Golden Bowl. Biographers Works Style and Themes Major Novels Shorter Narratives in 1904 he revisited America and lectured on Balzac. In 1906-1910 he published The American Scene and edited the New York Edition, a 24-volume collection of his works. In 1910 his brother William died, Henry had just joined William from an unsuccessful search for relief in Europe on what then turned out to be his last visit to the United States and was near him, according to a letter he wrote, when he died. In 1913 he wrote his autobiographies, A Small Boy and Others, and Notes of a Son and Brother. After the outbreak of the First World War in 1914 he did war work. In 1915 he became a British subject. In 1916 he was awarded the Order of Merit. He died on February 28, 1916, in Chelsea, London. As he requested, his ashes were buried in Cambridge Cemetery in Massachusetts. James regularly rejected suggestions that he should marry, and after settling in London proclaimed himself a bachelor. F. W. Du P., in several volumes on the James family, originated the theory that he had been in love with his cousin Mary Temple, but that a neurotic fear of sex kept him from admitting such affections, James's invalidism, was itself the symptom of some fear of or scruple against sexual love on his part. Dupe used an episode from James's memoir A Small Boy and Others, recounting a dream of a Napoleonic image in the Louvre, to exemplify James's romanticism about Europe, a Napoleonic fantasy into which he fled. Plays Dupe had not had access to the James family papers and worked principally from James's published memoir of his older brother, William, and the limited collection of letters edited by Percy Lubbock, heavily weighted toward James's last years. His account therefore moved directly from James's childhood, when he trailed after his older brother, to elderly invalidism. As more material became available to scholars, including the diaries of contemporaries and hundreds of affectionate and sometimes erotic letters written by James to younger men, the picture of neurotic celibacy gave way to a portrait of a closeted homosexual. Between 1953 and 1972, Leon Edel authored a major five-volume biography of James, which accessed unpublished letters and documents after Edel gained the permission of James's family. Edel's portrayal of James included the suggestion he was celibate. It was a view first propounded by critic Saul Rosenzweig in 1943. In 2004 Sheldon M. Novick published Henry James, The Young Master, followed by Henry James, The Mature Master. The first book caused something of an uproar in Jamesian circles as it challenged the previous received notion of celibacy, a once familiar paradigm in biographies of homosexuals when direct evidence was non-existent. Novick also criticized Edel for following the discounted Freudian interpretation of homosexuality as a kind of failure. The difference of opinion erupted in a series of exchanges between Edel and Novick which were published by the online magazine Slate, with the latter arguing that even the suggestion of celibacy went against James's own injunction live. Not. Fantasize. <laughs>
The interpretation of James as living a less austere emotional life has been subsequently explored by other scholars. The often intense politics of James Sheehan's scholarship has also been the subject of studies. Author Kalm Toibin has said that Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick's epistemology of the closet made a landmark difference to James Sheehan's scholarship by arguing that he be read as a homosexual writer whose desire to keep his sexuality a secret shaped his layered style and dramatic artistry. According to Toibin such a reading removed James from the realm of dead white males who wrote about posh people. He became our contemporary. James's letters to expatriate American sculptor Hendrik Christian Andersen have attracted particular attention. James met the 27-year-old Andersen in Rome in 1899, when James was 56, and wrote letters to Andersen that are intensely emotional, I hold you, dearest boy, in my innermost love, and count on your feeling me in every throb of your soul. In a letter of May 6, 1904, to his brother William, James referred to himself as always your hopelessly celibate even though sexagenarian Henry. How accurate that description might have been is the subject of contention among James's biographers, but the letters to Anderson were occasionally quasi-erotic, I put, my dear boy, my arm around you, and feel the pulsation, thereby, as it were, of our excellent future and your admirable endowment. To his homosexual friend Howard Sturgis, James could write, I repeat, almost to indiscretion, that I could live with you. Meanwhile I can only try to live without you. His many letters to the many young gay men among his close male friends are more forthcoming. In a letter to Howard Sturgis, Following a long visit, James refers jocularly to their happy little congress of two and in letters to Hugh Walpole he pursues convoluted jokes and puns about their relationship, referring to himself as an elephant who paws you oh so benevolently and whines about Walpole his well-meaning old trunk. His letters to Walter Berry printed by the Black Sun Press have long been celebrated for their lightly veiled eroticism. He corresponded in almost equally extravagant language with his many female friends, writing, for example, to fellow novelist Lucy Clifford, Dearest Lucy, what shall I say? When I love you so very, very much, and see you nine times for once that I see others. Therefore I think that if you want it made clear to the meanest intelligence I love you more than I love others. To his New York friend Mary Cadwallader Jones, dearest Mary Cadwallader. I yearn over you, but I yearn in vain, your long silence really breaks my heart, mystifies, depresses, almost alarms me, to the point even of making me wonder if poor unconscious and doting old Salamare has done anything, in some dark somnambulism of the spirit, which has given you a bad moment, or a wrong impression, or a colorable pretext. However these things may be, he loves you as tenderly as ever, nothing, to the end of time, will ever detach him from you, and he remembers those eleventh st matutinal end times hours, those telephonic matinees, as the most romantic of his life. His long friendship with American novelist Constance Fenimore Wilson, in whose house he lived for a number of weeks in Italy in 1887, and his shock and grief over her suicide in 1894, are discussed in detail in Edel's biography and play a central role in a study by Lyndall Gordon. James is one of the major figures of transatlantic literature. His works frequently juxtapose characters from the old world, embodying a feudal civilization that is beautiful, often corrupt, and alluring, and from the new world, 
where people are often brash, open, and assertive and embody the virtues freedom and a more highly evolved moral character of the new American society. James explores this clash of personalities and cultures, in stories of personal relationships in which power is exercised well or badly. His protagonists were often young American women facing oppression or abuse, and as his secretary Theodora Bosanke remarked in her monograph Henry James at Work. Nonfiction When he walked out of the refuge of his study and into the world and looked around him, he saw a place of torment, where creatures of prey perpetually thrust their claws into the quivering flesh of doomed, defenseless children of light. His novels are a repeated exposure of this wickedness a reiterated and passionate plea for the fullest freedom of development, unimperiled by reckless and barbarous stupidity. Critics have jokingly described three phases in the development of James's prose, James I, James II, and The Old Pretender. He wrote short stories and plays. Finally, in his third and last period he returned to the long, serialist novel. Beginning in the second period, but most noticeably in the third, he increasingly abandoned direct statement in favor of frequent double negatives, and complex descriptive imagery. Single paragraphs began to run for page after page, in which an initial noun would be succeeded by pronouns surrounded by clouds of adjectives and prepositional clauses, far from their original reference and verbs would be deferred and then preceded by a series of adverbs. The overall effect could be a vivid evocation of a scene as perceived by a sensitive observer. It has been debated whether this change of style was engendered by James shifting from writing to dictating to a typist, a change made during the composition of what Maisie knew. Reception in its intense focus on the consciousness of his major characters, James's later work foreshadows extensive developments in 20th century fiction. Indeed, he might have influenced stream of consciousness writers such as Virginia Woolf, who not only read some of his novels but also wrote essays about them. Both contemporary and modern readers have found the late style difficult and unnecessary. His friend Edith Warden, who admired him greatly, said that there were passages in his work that were all but incomprehensible. James was harshly portrayed by H. G. Wells as a hippopotamus laboriously attempting to pick up a pea that had got into a corner of its cage. The late James style was ably parroted by Max Beerbohm in The Moat in the Middle Distance. More important for his work overall may have been his position as an expatriate, and in other ways an outsider, living in Europe. While he came from middle class and provincial beginnings he worked very hard to gain access to all levels of society, and the settings of his fiction range from working class to aristocratic, and often described the efforts of middle class Americans to make their way in European capitals. He confessed he got some of his best story ideas from gossip at the dinner table or at country house weekends. He worked for a living, however, and lacked the experiences of select schools, university and army service, the common bonds of masculine society. He was furthermore a man whose tastes and interests were according to the prevailing standards of Victorian era Anglo-American culture rather feminine, and who was shadowed by the cloud of prejudice that then and later accompanied suspicions of his homosexuality. Edmund Wilson famously compared James's objectivity to Shakespeare's. Criticism, Biographies and Fictional Treatments Portrayals in Fiction Notes one would be in a position to appreciate James better if one compared him with the dramatists of the 17th century Racine and Moliere, whom he resembles in form as well as in point of view, and even Shakespeare, 
when allowances are made for the most extreme differences in subject and form. These poets are not, like Dickens and Hardy, writers of melodrama either humorous or pessimistic, nor secretaries of society like Balzac, nor prophets like Tolstoy, they are occupied simply with the presentation of conflicts of moral character, which they do not concern themselves about softening or averting. They do not indict society for these situations, they regard them as universal and inevitable. They do not even blame God for allowing them, they accept them as the conditions of life. It is also possible to see many of James's stories as psychological thought experiments. In his preface to the New York edition of The American he describes the development of the story in his mind as exactly such, the situation of an American, some robust but insidiously beguiled and betrayed, some cruelly wronged, compatriot. With the focus of the story being on the response of this wronged man. The portrait of a lady may be an experiment to see what happens when an idealistic young woman suddenly becomes very rich. In many of his tales, characters seem to exemplify alternate futures and possibilities, as most markedly in The Jolly Corner, in which the protagonist and a ghost doppelganger live alternate American and European lives, and in others, like The Ambassadors, an older James seems fondly to regard his own younger self facing a crucial moment. The first period of James's fiction, usually considered to have culminated in the portrait of a lady, concentrated on the contrast between Europe and America. The style of these novels is generally straightforward and, though personally characteristic, well within the norms of 19th century fiction. Roderick Hudson is a coon roman that traces the development of the title character, an extremely talented sculptor. Although the book shows some signs of immaturity this was James's first serious attempt at a full-length novel it has attracted favorable comment due to the vivid realization of the three major characters, Roderick Hudson, superbly gifted but unstable and unreliable, Roland Mallet, Roderick's limited but much more mature friend and patron, and Christina Light, one of James's most enchanting and maddening femme fatale. The pair of Hudson and Mallet has been seen as representing the two sides of James's own nature, the wildly imaginative artist and the brooding conscientious mentor. In The Portrait of a Lady James concluded the first phase of his career with a novel that remains his most popular piece of long fiction. The story is of a spirited young American woman, Isabel Archer, who affronts her destiny and finds it overwhelming. She inherits a large amount of money and subsequently becomes the victim of Machiavellian scheming by two American expatriates. The narrative is set mainly in Europe, especially in England and Italy. Generally regarded as the masterpiece of his early phase, The Portrait of a Lady is described as a psychological novel, exploring the minds of his characters, and almost a work of social science, exploring the differences between Europeans and Americans, the old and the new worlds. The second period of James's career, which extends from the publication of The Portrait of a Lady through the end of the 19th century, features less popular novels including The Princess Casamassima, published serially in the Atlantic Monthly in 1885-1886, and The Bostonians, published serially in the Century magazine during the same period. This period also featured James's celebrated Gothic novella, The Turn of the Screw. The third period of James's career reached its most significant achievement in three novels published just around the start of the 20th century, The Wings of the Dove, The Ambassadors, and The Golden Bowl. Critic F. O. Matheson called this trilogy James's major phase, and these novels have certainly received intense critical study. It was the second written of the books, 
the wings of the dove that was the first published because it attracted no serialization. This novel tells the story of Millie Thiel, an American heiress stricken with a serious disease, and her impact on the people around her. Some of these people befriend Millie with honorable motives, while others are more self-interested. James stated in his autobiographical books that Millie was based on Minnie Temple, his beloved cousin who died at an early age of tuberculosis. He said that he attempted in the novel to wrap her memory in the beauty and dignity of art. James was particularly interested in what he called the beautiful and blessed nouvelle, or the longer form of short narrative. Still, he produced a number of very short stories in which he achieved notable compression of sometimes complex subjects. The following narratives are representative of James's achievement in the shorter forms of fiction. At several points in his career James wrote plays, beginning with one-act plays written for periodicals in 1869 and 1871 and a dramatization of his popular novella Daisy Miller in 1882. From 1890 to 1892, having received a bequest that freed him from magazine publication, he made a strenuous effort to succeed on the London stage writing a half-dozen plays of which only one, a dramatization of his novel The American, was produced. This play was performed for several years by a touring repertory company and had a respectable run in London, but did not earn very much money for James. His other plays written at this time were not produced. In 1893, however, he responded to a request from actor-manager George Alexander for a serious play for the opening of his renovated St. James's Theatre, and wrote a long drama, Guy Domville, which Alexander produced. There was a noisy uproar on the opening night, January 5, 1895, with hissing from the gallery when James took his bow after the final curtain, and the author was upset. The play received moderately good reviews and had a modest run of four weeks before being taken off to make way for Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, which Alexander thought would have better prospects for the coming season. After the stresses and disappointment of these efforts James insisted that he would write no more for the theatre, but within weeks had agreed to write a curtain raiser for Ellen Terry. This became the one-act Summersoft, which he later rewrote into a short story, Covering End, and then expanded into a full-length play, The High Bid, which had a brief run in London in 1907, when James made another concerted effort to write for the stage. He wrote three new plays, two of which were in production when the death of Edward VII on May 6, 1910 plunged London into mourning and theatres closed. Discouraged by failing health and the stresses of theatrical work, James did not renew his efforts in the theatre, but recycled his plays as successful novels. The Outcry was a bestseller in the United States when it was published in 1911. During the years 1890-1893 when he was most engaged with the theatre, James wrote a good deal of theatrical criticism and assisted Elizabeth Robbins and others in translating and producing Henrik Ibsen for the first time in London. Leon Edel argued in his psychoanalytic biography that James was traumatised by the opening night uproar that greeted Guy Domville, and that it plunged him into a prolonged depression. The successful later novels, in Edel's view, were the result of a kind of self-analysis, expressed in fiction, which partly freed him from his fears. Other biographers and scholars have not accepted this account, however, the more common view being that of F.O. Matheson, who wrote, instead of being crushed by the collapse of his hopes, he felt a resurgence of new energy.
Beyond his fiction, James was one of the more important literary critics in the history of the novel. In his classic essay The Art of Fiction, he argued against rigid prescriptions on the novelist's choice of subject and method of treatment. He maintained that the widest possible freedom in content and approach would help ensure narrative fiction's continued vitality. James wrote many valuable critical articles on other novelists, typical is his book-length study of Nathaniel Hawthorne, which has been the subject of critical debate. Richard Broadhead has suggested that the study was emblematic of James's struggle with Hawthorne's influence, and constituted an effort to place the elder writer at a disadvantage. Gordon Fraser, meanwhile, has suggested that the study was part of a more commercial effort by James to introduce himself to British readers as Hawthorne's natural successor. When James assembled the New York edition of his fiction in his final years, he wrote a series of prefaces that subjected his own work to searching, occasionally harsh criticism. At 22 James wrote The Noble School of Fiction for the Nation's first issue in 1865. He would write, in all, over 200 essays and book, art and theatre reviews for the magazine. For most of his life James harbored ambitions for success as a playwright. He converted his novel The American into a play that enjoyed modest returns in the early 1890s. In all he wrote about a dozen plays, most of which went unproduced. His costume drama Guy Domville failed disastrously on its opening night in 1895. James then largely abandoned his efforts to conquer the stage and returned to his fiction. In his notebooks he maintained that his theatrical experiment benefited his novels and tales by helping him dramatize his characters' thoughts and emotions. James produced a small but valuable amount of theatrical criticism, including perceptive appreciations of Henrik Ibsen. With his wide-ranging artistic interests, James occasionally wrote on the visual arts. Perhaps his most valuable contribution was his favorable assessment of fellow expatriate John Singer Sargent, a painter whose critical status has improved markedly in recent decades. James also wrote sometimes charming, sometimes brooding articles about various places he visited and lived in. His most famous books of travel writing include Italian Hours and The American Scene. James was one of the great letter writers of any era. More than 10,000 of his personal letters are extant, and over 3,000 have been published in a large number of collections. A complete edition of James's letters began publication in 2006, edited by Pierre Walker and Greg Zacharias. As of 2014, eight volumes have been published covering the period from 1855 to 1880. James's correspondence included celebrated contemporaries like Robert Louis Stevenson, Edith Wharton, and Joseph Conrad, along with many others in his wide circle of friends and acquaintances. The letters range from the mere twaddle of graciousness to serious discussions of artistic, social, and personal issues. Very late in life James began a series of autobiographical works, A Small Boy and Others, Notes of a Son and Brother, and The Unfinished The Middle Years. These books portray the development of a classic observer who was passionately interested in artistic creation but was somewhat reticent about participating fully in the life around him. James's work has remained steadily popular with the limited audience of educated readers to whom he spoke during his lifetime, and has remained firmly in the canon, but, after his death, some American critics, such as Van Wyck Brooks, expressed hostility towards James for his long expatriation and eventual naturalization as a British subject.
Other critics such as E. M. Forster complained about what they saw as James's squeamishness in the treatment of sex and other possibly controversial material, or dismissed his late style as difficult and obscure, relying heavily on extremely long sentences and excessively Latinate language. Similarly Oscar Wilde criticized him for writing fiction as if it were a painful duty. Vernon Parrington composing a canon of American literature, condemned James for having cut himself off from America. Jorge Luis Borges wrote about him, despite the scruples and delicate complexities of James, his work suffers from a major defect, the absence of life. And Virginia Woolf, writing to Lytton Strachey, asked, Please tell me what you find in Henry James. We have his works here, and I read, and I can't find anything but faintly tinged rose water, urbane and sleek, but vulgar and pale as Walter Lamb. Is there really any sense in it? Calm Toybin observed that James never really wrote about the English very well. His English characters don't work for me. Despite these criticisms, James is now valued for his psychological and moral realism, his masterful creation of character, his low-key but playful humor, and his assured command of the language. In his 1983 book, The Novels of Henry James, Edward Wagenecht offers an assessment that echoes Theodora Boson case. To be completely great, Henry James wrote in an early review, a work of art must lift up the heart, and his own novels do this to an outstanding degree. More than sixty years after his death, the great novelist who sometimes professed to have no opinions stands foursquare in the great Christian humanistic and democratic tradition. The men and women who, at the height of World War II, raided the second-hand shops for his out-of-print books knew what they were about. For no writer ever raised a braver banner to which all who love freedom might adhere. William Dean Howells saw James as a representative of a new realist school of literary art which broke with the English Romantic tradition epitomized by the works of Charles Dickens and William Makepeace Thackeray. Howells wrote that realism found its chief exemplar in Mr. James. A novelist he is not, after the old fashion or after any fashion but his own. Fr. Levis championed Henry James as a novelist of established preeminence in the great tradition, asserting that The Portrait of a Lady and the Bostonians were the two most brilliant novels in the language. James is now prized as a master of point of view who moved literary fiction forward by insisting in showing, not telling, his stories to the reader. Henry James has been the subject of a number of novels and stories, including the following. David Lodge also wrote a long essay about writing about Henry James in his collection The Year of Henry James, The Story of a Novel. James was also an eager poet his peak after his famous failure Guy Domville in which supposedly many poems were written, most revolving around negative connotations like death darkness etc. Most of these have been lost, but his more popular works such as In the Darkness and Death Bejeweled have remained. Citations <laughs>